Welcome to the seminar on computational geometry and robotics. Uh, I give more detailed introductions when the speaker is outside the computational geometry community, but our speaker today is very much inside the community. So uh, I'm glad to welcome our speaker, Erin Chambers who will speak about applications of geometry and topology to root analysis. Erin, please. All right, thank you very much. Um, so clearly you, you see the title already. Um, so I'm, this is a, a sort of broad overview of a very long-term collaboration. So this is with Dave Letcher, who's here at SLU with me, and uh, my colleague Tao Ju, who's at uh, Washington University, just down the street. And then uh, more recently with Chris Topp, who's a plant biologist at the Danforth Plant Sciences Institute. Um, and a, and a, a host of students and postdocs who I will acknowledge. And in particular, the students and the postdocs get lots of credit for the images and technical details. So um, bear with me, I try to call out the publications where appropriate, but uh, okay. So what is, oops, what? screen am I on? All right, let's try that again. So this talk fits loosely under sort of a common pipeline in computational topology or topological data analysis, which is we somehow get geometric data or something <laughs> and we want to analyze it. And the data itself is, is messy and noisy and dense. So we try to simplify it to some kind of signature. You know, uh, Persistence diagrams are pretty famous, but you can talk about medial axes, which I'll talk about, read graphs, or the characteristics, for Shea matchings, all kinds of things which are meant to say, okay, you've taken this data set from Euclidean space that's messy and you know point samples usually, and you want to make a signature. And then depending on where the data set came from, usually the goal is some kind of analysis, shape comparison, statistics, machine learning, right? So this is a very broad umbrella. Um, and the reason I'm starting with this is just to, to explain where I fit in. So I, the geometric data we're working on is actually an embedded root, a plant sometimes the top half but more usually in my collaboration it's the bottom half of the plan which i'll talk about in a minute and then we're using a range of signatures but primarily tools from persistent homology and medial axes to do skeletons that's our chosen signature and then finally we hand off and here's where i'm not the expert to the plant biologists who want to do something with that really they want to do phenotype analysis they want to know about the plant so let me let me unpack that a bit. Um, the, the chosen application that I'm, I'm sort of viewing this through the lens of is root architecture. So this is a really famous study from relatively recent, 2013 in Nature Genetics, that both of these are rice, the same rice, in fact, with one single base pair change, which not a biologist, uh, but, but that signature at the top is meant to indicate that one gene has changed. And this is sort of a proof of concept study to motivate this field of research in biology because it drastically affects the root architecture. Now, the, the shape of the root is also controlled by nitrogen in the soil and rocks and all kinds of other environment factors, but it does seem to have a very strong genetic component as well. Like this is a grown in the same field with just this one change, if I am quoting the literature right, which my collaborators tell me I'm doing okay. Um, so this is really important, right? Crops is really the motivation. Everybody likes to eat plants, grow a lot of our food, and hence we should do some studying of how to make the plants better in different types of fields and different types of environmental conditions. Now, the caveat here is the last time I actually took a biology course was in high school. I know nothing, the, 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 actually the, the way I came to this project was backwards. I came to the root or to the skeleton analysis first, computational geometer, topologist, right? That's where I started. And we found the application later. And so the, the applications are bootstrapped in phase one and phase three, whereas the core of what I started on was the middle of this pipeline. Um, so all the errors I make in plant biology, if anybody knows more about it than I do, I apologize. Well, I'll do my best. Um, so, okay, so how do we come to this? This is my collaborator, Chris, on the left. And here is how we gather the data. If I'm starting with phase one of my pipeline, somehow we get geometric data. So what he does is grows roots in a variety of different ways. So what he's holding up there is actually a rice plant in gel. So he does clear gel growth and gets this beautiful time varying data set because he can literally scan it every day. 
and perfectly measure how the roots change. Uh, really high volume CT scans is the output. Now this particular pipeline to gather the data has some critiques because of course the gel is not a natural environment. It's not in soil, it's not, you know, it's in a perfectly controlled little vat. Um, so he also sort of supplementing this data, um, this is data taken from his corn root project. There's actually uh, other plants they do this with, but they literally go out every summer, the whole lab, which he calls it his shovel omics, they go out with shovels and they dig up the corn roots. And of course they damage them in the process, but they do their best to collect intact corn roots from grown in the same plot, set genetic specimens, set experiments as far as the sun and the water and everything else. Um, and they wash it off and scan it. And so we get this really high quality, uh, voxelized data, right? Stacks of CT scans, sort of a, a typical format. Okay, so they have this, and then the goal is what do we do with it? <laughs> you have this beautiful data and like everybody else, you know, you gotta figure out what to do with the data. Um, so here's a sort of proof of concept that, that Chris, my collaborator pulled out, um, which I'm not gonna go into the details of this study because it's, it's not relevant for the, the geometry topology analysis. But what they did was compare, it, prior to this work where they were imaging, it was literally dig up the root and measure it, right? Like bounding boxes, rough, how dense does it look? Um, very sort of crude statistics. And unsurprisingly, 3D data looks better, right? If you, if you do sort of obvious crude analysis with some of these 3D traits, you can better cluster the, the, so this is the 2D versus the 3D, right? If you just take, lay it down and take a picture versus if you do the 3D scan. This is highly motivating, but maybe we can do better than just volume and bounding boxes and very simple shape statistics because there's a lot going on in this route. So this is where we come in. Um, so what do we need to do? And here's my, my pipeline again, but with this root front and center. We first get the image, which is a 3D voxelized, just intensity threshold, right? Each voxel gets an intensity. Um, okay, well, it's the wrong topology. The, the beauty of this data set from my perspective is I know exactly what the topology is. It's a tree from the computer science perspective. This, by the way, is one of the confusions of working with biologists. They mean something very different by tree and root. So let me be a computer scientist for a minute. This shape, this root is a tree. It is simply connected with no loops. Everything should be very simple. Now you cannot get that simple thresholding. And of course, uh, segmentation is a well-studied problem, but even good segmentation algorithms leave what I would call topological errors. So I'm showing that in the middle here um, where you've, you've got an extraneous handle, you've got some extraneous holes. None of those should exist in this route. And the reason in my particular application to clean that up is, again, my goal is skeletonization. And so I need a very clean geometric reconstruction in order to get an accurate medial axis skeleton, which will be the middle part of the talk. And then finally, at the very end, I'll talk a bit about what my collaborators are doing for the pipeline downstream. I'm, I'm less on the statistics and analysis, not a geneticist, but um, what they're doing to really make use of this tool and try to argue that this is important for plant biologists too. Okay, so that's my overview, and I've tried to separate it into these three phases. Uh, again, the irony is that I came to this out of order, so you'll see the citations I'm listing come very out of order as we go, but, but bear with me. First step is topological repair in this pipeline. I have this data, and there's a lot of different kinds of errors it can have. So the left is the root. The three images just to the right of it are zoom-ins of this data, where I'm showing in, in the, the far left of the three disconnected components. There's a little trail of bits where my, my reconstruction, my best segmentation algorithm could not connect the root back up. Roots are connected, so that's a problem. Um, C, the middle one, is showing um, handles, right? It's showing that I've, I've introduced extra topology. This shape is not simply connected for that reason. And, and D is almost an artifact of the root itself. And I'll, I'll talk more about this later. It turns out this is a corn root and most of our data so far has been focusing on this corn root data set because it's a big one that they have a lot of. Um, corn roots are hollow. 
things you learn. So the segmentation, the best segmentation possible, actually shows a hole in the stem. And worse, it's an erratic hole. It shows up here, it doesn't show up here, and then it might show up again later, depending on the point scan, or the CT scan, rather. And even worse, they damage these roots sometimes, or the, the walls get very thin in certain sections, depending on how you harvest it. And so often it's not just that there's a hole in the middle, there's punctures in the shell. We call those pseudo holes. They're not really holes, but they're places where an indentation has been made and it shouldn't have been, or where the, the uh, skin is so thin of the root that it, it just doesn't show up in the segmentation, no matter how we threshold and repair. So here's my problem. And there's a lot of different ways to fix this. Um, by the way, please stop me if there are questions. I get kind of excited and go faster and faster. So feel free to interrupt with questions. Um, okay, so how do we repair? So this is sort of a survey of common tools, computer graphics, um, and surface reconstruction. This is well studied. So the way I would phrase this as a topologist, if you want to fix the topology, not necessarily figuring out the geometry right now, um, is we need to cut things or fill things. I have extra handles, which probably need to be sliced. And I have perhaps disconnected components, which need to be reconnected. And this is very focused on my 3D data set of roots, but it, it holds more broadly in a lot of reconstruction. Um, so there's existing methods which are monotonic, meaning they only add things or they only remove things. Now this is a problem, and this is what the, the input shape is on the far left. The, the middle left is showing, well, if you only add things and you have a handle, the best you can do is add a disk to kill that handle to repair the topology. Okay, that doesn't look like a root. This was a poor choice, geometrically speaking, even though topologically, it's made it simply connected again. Um, the deletion only, which is the, the right of the middle two, just removes everything, it just cuts everything that doesn't look right. Now the problem, especially in this root data set, but even in other ones, is that this cuts off too much, right? We really wanted to keep some of that interesting architecture at the edges, so we can't just cut. And then there are non-monotonic, which try to add and remove. Now, like I said, this is well studied. What, what we found was a lot of these existing implementations didn't work fast enough on our data set. These are really large and they need a fairly high throughput because they, they get a lot of them, um, or they didn't they didn't use the geometry well enough. This is the plant root. And so we know something about how the reconstruction should work. And so the naive methods really failed us when we tried to apply these existing reconstructions. Okay, so our first approach goes solely into computational topology and phrases this as a variant of the homological simplification. I have a shape. I can think of sort of a core. If, if I lower my threshold or I look geometrically nearby, I sort of have a core that I know is root. And I have a set of things that could be added, which if I in increase my intensity threshold, I get what I call the set of fills, right? A, a larger shape that it includes into. And so we phrase it so that what we wanna do is, is get the correct topology, look at the inclusion of the small into the big and try to identify a set of cut and fills that will fix this. Now, the downside there, I, I didn't have the citation, this is a lovely uh, 2016 sausage paper, 2015. Um, it's NP Harv, even for 3D data and very nice complexes. This is not too shocking because we know knot theory is pretty hard, right? Identifying knots is kind of one of these classical hard problems, and this is getting pretty close that I could imagine a root that is knotted in itself. And so perfectly solving this is unlikely. Um, so what we did was apply a heuristic approach. Let's just look for cuts and fills and see how much we can fix it. Um, so we're trying, it, our first approach was, was a, a monotonic one, just to see how we could do. So we use topological data analysis here to look for likely noise and to try to fix it. This was a, a CCDG paper a few years back. Um, the shocking thing is that the naive approach on this real world data set worked shockingly well. It removed 99% of noise. Now, the thing we weren't happy about, this was a monotonic approach and we knew we needed to remove things also. In particular, we sort of fail, you can't see it here, but we really fail near the core of the, the root, near that stalk, that, the thing that goes into the stem, the, the primary root stalk. Um, the other downside was that we're doing 
I mean, topological data analysis essentially is going to boil down to matrix operations, and that's very slow on large data. So then, okay, we have a proof of concept. It works. Um, the other downside is, is the geometry. We try to reconnect things, but you can see a lot of our reconstructions. If you look in the far right of the after, yes, we reconnected, but we kind of squiggled a lot because um, we used the, the intensity threshold to guide our repair, whereas probably you should have just done a straight line segment there and use the geometric knowledge that it's a route to do a better fix. Um, so our extended implementation, which was really led by my former postdoc, Hannah Schreiber, um, improves the repair by finding better fills and adds cuts. So now it's a truly non-monotonic, much faster. Um, and in addition, we tackle what we call these pseudo holes, which I hinted at earlier. Here's a zoom in of um, what I mean by that, the, 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 the main route here is empty and there's erratic indentations of varying sizes. Some are large and some are small. And so we need to figure out how to fill those without killing the handles or losing the geometry near here. Because one of the things downstream the biologists are interested in is the shape of these, they call these uh, whorls, where the roots come off. They're interested in the angles. Do they go deep? Do they go wide? How close are they? Like all that geometric knowledge we want to maintain as much as possible. Okay, so this implementation um, is available. Um, now I, I'm hinting at what I'm going to talk about in phase two, which is the skeletonization. But this was really our motivation was to repair it so that we could skeletonize it. Um, and here's an illustration of the impact of this downstream. Um, so the initial shape is on the left. And of course, it's a mess in the middle, right? This is supposed to be a skeleton. And you can see 2D, like the shading is meant to indicate significance of various metrics you can put on the medial axis when you're computing it. It doesn't do very well because this is a mess. And even after our addition only, if you look near the top of the root in the middle, you can see a big mess of blue curves. That's because we haven't properly filled the pseudovoid. We haven't been able to fill in that root void and patch all the little holes. And so the skeleton is trying to go around all the little holes. That's what skeletons do. Um, and so the final implementation um, is much able, much better able to indicate that center root stock, which is, again, one of the things they're mainly interested in. Here, the coloring comes from the significance measures we're computing on this shape. So again, I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. You're getting a little preview of the middle part of the talk. So we're pretty happy with this. This is currently under review, but um, this seems a viable candidate. Um, so this is sort of the topological data approach. Interestingly, our, our collaborator Tao Ju led a separate approach, which was quite interesting, um, at which I won't go as much into details because the reduction is fairly technical, but he turned it into an NP-hard problem. I was highly skeptical, although we also faced an NP-hard problem. He uh, looked at a set of cuts and fills where instead of looking at the geometric shape at all, he turned it into a graph problem. He identified cuts and fills and indicated them. That's the graph on the right here. Um, so this, this 2D shape is meant to say, OK, we have sort of a core, which is K here, kernels. You have a set of possible cuts and a set of possible fills. He literally turned that into a graph. He said, OK, you have to have the core. You could have the neighborhood. And here are the possible cuts and fills to do. Um, so this is, was in SIGGRAPH Asia last year. Through this reduction and a few other reductions, which, which I'll admit, you got to read the paper, it gets a bit technical and I, I don't have an hour to talk just about this. Um, he actually then can change it to a Steiner tree-like problem. He looks up, there's very good Steiner tree approximate solvers that aren't going to give you anything exact, but are going to do pretty well. And he's able to use a, these approximate solvers to get a very fast heuristic solution. So he completely turned the problem on its head uh, in a, a really cool way and turned it into, in fact, a graph problem, which existing solvers could optimize. So these kind of represent two different approaches to simplification. Both of these are built into our final tool. And one of our goals for future study is to figure out if one of them is better than the other in terms of the later analysis. Um, jury's still out on that, but it was, it was important to have options for the biologists later. OK. That's my step one. So I've got the data. At this point, at least hypothetically, the data is fairly clean. <laughs> and now the goal is to do skeletons. So this is actually the first piece of the work where we started with it. So our entire approach, and here's where the geometry in the title comes in, is based on something called the medial axis. Um, this was first introduced, well, arguably, in 1967 by Blum. This is one of these obvious 
objects, which has been rediscovered many, many times. So, so bear with me. Um, but the idea is take a shape, and here I'm just starting with a 2D shape. Um, look at all the inscribed circles. This will go really fast in a geometry seminar, which is great. And, and take the center points of all those maximal inscribed circles. Okay, so this is the, just the set of points in this closed object with more than one closest point on the boundary of the shape. It can also, in Blum's original work, it is introduced as the quench sites of a fire front. It's a grass fire analogy is what he calls it if you look at the paper, which I think is pretty cool. So you light a fire at the boundary, the fire burns across the shape, and you look at where the front hits itself. Equivalent definitions, at least for Euclidean space with no obstacles. This starts to change if you're on a surface and you're doing geodesics, but, but we're working with 3D geometry, so everything's pretty nice. Okay, so the good. Why do I like this object for a skeleton in contrast to other skeletonizations? Um, it reduces the dimension. And I would say formally it has co-dimension at least one. It's possible it's not only one dimension lower. And in, indeed in the, the 3D shape in the bottom right, uh, you can't see perfectly, but there's both sheets and, uh, you know, segments sticking out. Um, so, so it does reduce the dimension of the object, which is one of the goals of a, a shape descriptor is to simplify. Computers do much better with graphs than with 3D structures. Um, it does have the same topology as the original uh, shape, which is uh, kind of non-negotiable in my world. Topology is important. You can't disconnect the shape. Um, Surprisingly, this was assumed for 40 years and obviously was true, but it wasn't actually proven until 2003. So Andre Ludier has a beautiful, highly technical proof showing that it maintains the topology. You would think this is obvious, right? It looks like it's a deformation retract, but in very subtle ways, it's not. And so it takes a fair amount of work to show that, but it does work. I'm dealing with closed bounded objects in R3, so I'm happy with this. And most importantly for me, it's central to the shape. And because of that, we can get a lot of statistics on it. We can get local feature size, right? How big that ball was and sort of get a sense of the geometry from this lower dimensional object. So this is the good. I should be honest about the bad, which we, we knew going in. It is extraordinarily sensitive to perturbation. And in particular, what I've done here is taken a square and added a single little bump at the top. And without that bump, that entire branch of medial axis would go away. The minute the bump is there, you get this entire arc of the medial axis created. This is a, a you know, a, in any geometric sense, this can be an arbitrarily tiny piece of noise and it will still drastically alter the geometry of the, the resulting axis. Um, now, this gets even worse with sort of real objects, you know, in, the, in this horse, probably you, you can see the curve I'm looking for in the center. Right, and people familiar with Voronoi-based methods are gonna, gonna recognize similarities here. There's this nice central object that I'm after, but I get all this noise from the, the detail of the shape. Um, it can be, I can't overstate this, extremely difficult to, do, uh, oops, yeah, to compute this exactly in 3D. And in fact, no one really does. There's work on exact computation for B spines in three dimensions, uh, but, in fact, what everybody does, and here's the geometry, really, this is a Voronoi approximation. You sample the boundary, you compute the Delaunay triangulation or the Voronoi complex, and um, it turns out a subset of the Voronoi diagram is what people say is the medial axis, because doing this for continuous objects is really hard. But the good thing is a lot of approximate solvers exist. In fact, this is the basis of um, things like power crust for reconstruction of shapes. Um, so it's, it's pretty well understood to compute it. And then um, you can have different dimensions in the medial axis. It's not always co-dimension one. And here I'm trying to show that a little more exactly. You've got all these spiky bits, even for a fairly nice dolphin shape um, for the outer object. When you burn in, you get nothing really smooth for the curve in the middle. Okay, despite that, this is my chosen object because I do like the central and the topology maintenance. So my goal is to somehow use this as a basis for the skeleton, but prune it, right? Simplify it, put a, a function on it that captures the important pieces, uh, geometrically speaking, and ignores the, the noisy bits for me. Um, now again, significance measures on the medial axis are uh, fairly well studied. They come up in shape modeling, shape segmentation, all kinds of different areas. Um, 
but there are some known ones and, and worth mentioning just to see. Um, so a lot of times you just prune the medial axis to get these significant ones, which is what we're gonna try to do. A few of the famous examples, one is object angle. So here's a, a little local piece of shape in medial axis and the inscribed circle has at least two closest points, sometimes more. Uh, generically, you never have more than three in two dimensions, but here I'm showing you one with two. I can look at the angle between those. It's a very natural one. It's one of the earliest ones studied because somehow the closer you get to the boundary, the more that angle is going to narrow. And if you're in the core of the shape, you maybe expect a very large, you know, this one's going to this side, this one's going to this side, and they're nearly pi in terms of how far apart they are. This is in 2D. There's analogs in 3D <coughs> and higher dimensions. Um, and then there's also circumradius is a pretty well studied one. Again, a natural idea. Instead of just looking at the angle, look at the distance. And again, the more central you are in the shape, the more you hope this would be a larger value for more significant portions. Unfortunately, neither of these work in my world because I care deeply about both the topology and sort of the further down portion. So here's a, a, a brief hand wavy why I'm not happy with these. With object angle, um, what I'm showing on the bottom is the horse with its skeleton that I showed a few slides ago. And it's colored um, so that the red bits are higher value and the blue bits are the lowest. So the warmer the color gets, the more significant the piece of medial axis is. If you do simple thresholding, you destroy the topology. The resulting skeleton in the top right there for some thresholded value is not even connected. And, and again, you know, I've got roots in mind, but even more intrinsically, I'm, I am somewhat of a topologist. I, I really care about maintaining topological features and this destroys connectedness, which is not a, a really a good thing. On the right is the, uh, the circumradius version of this. Again, we've colored based on how far apart things are. Now this one does better. Uh, the, the, the thing stays connected with thresholding. This one is actually the basis of the work on the lambda medial axis, which is a pretty famous alternative and a very nice skeleton. Um, the reason we didn't like this, if you do thresholding, is that you cut off long, thin pieces, right? Somehow that the legs, if you look at it, have been chopped off because the objects or the closest ones on the boundary are very close together along the entire length of the leg. Like that's just a function of how we're cutting things. Um, and in these plants, I have very long, thin bits, right? This isn't gonna work for me. I, I need to keep those because those are very important. I can play with the threshold value, but it turns out no matter how you do it, this is gonna cut off long spindly bits. If you wanna do any decent amount of simplification to get the noise of the core out, you're gonna lose bits on the end. And so again, this didn't work so well for us. We wanted something that took into account, not just how close they are, but where they are on the actual medial axis, right? If they're further in on the medial axis, I wanted to keep it somehow. Okay spending a lot of time on the geometry, but maybe that's appropriate for this group. Everybody still with me? Okay. All good so far? Yes, okay. we are. <laughs> Excellent. So we like one, geometry. I love geometry, it's a good, good fit here. Um, so one alternative that came up in our, our sort of literature search is a, a more 1992, is called potential residue. Um, and at a medial axis point, this is the shortest distance on the boundary. Um, so, so I think I have a picture here. So here are my two nearest points. And instead of just connecting them, force it to follow the geodesic of the shape, right? So to connect these two points, you're not allowed to go in the interior of the shape. You have to stay on the boundary. Yeah, so that what this means is the point X, the, the, I have two X's and that was a poor choice. The leftmost X I have shown has to go all the way around the boundary. Whereas the middle X only has to go a little way around the boundary. This one, actually really captures, this was a motivating one for us because it captures the global features incredibly nicely and it is generalized to 3D. So this is some lovely work on the medial geodesic function. Um, the downside of this one, like this was kind of our goal to use initially, is that it's slow. Uh, it's incredibly slow. Geodesics and 3D objects are, are nothing to, <laughs> it could be a very slow object to compute. They're not unique. You've got curvature on this 3D object and. Um, it can really be a slow process. <clears throat> Another one we looked at, but which comes more from the graphics community, is sort of a heuristic measure. Um, they say, okay, what? imagine you took the medial axis point and pruned it here. 
draw the ball and prune it outside of the ball to one side. And, and to one side, it's a bit hand wavy. This was an iterative, very heuristic approach. But essentially what they're capturing in both in this definition, which they did make fairly technical and they gave an algorithm for it, is the shaded blue parts on either one, right? Imagine you truncated at the ball and got rid of this stuff. How much do you lose in terms of area? Um, this one seemed quite stable and quite nice. Um, erosion thickness was a better bet if you look at the right versus the potential residue where you're looking at the boundary length. Um, <clears throat> both are fairly robust to, to general noise. Um, the one thing we found is potential residue is not robust to sort of one-sided noise. Um, so if you look at the key, it looks like a key here on the left column. Um, at the top, we've got a very smooth boundary. And at the bottom, we've perturbed it. There's a lot of jaggedy bits. So of course, what these jaggedy bits do is drive up the geodesic length, right? Now, instead of just paying this nice smooth path, you've got to pay for all the wiggly ups and downs. So even for a very small, in terms of house door for Frechet for distance perturbation, you pay a lot more because now the path has wiggled a lot. <laughs> um, the nice thing for erosion thickness, when you do the same thing and you add all those wiggles, it moves a little bit, but not very much because those wiggles don't have very much area. So the, 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 the cut it off and see how much it changes, this heuristic approach doesn't move very much. So this led us sort of solidly to erosion thickness. Now, again, I'm, I'm working in 3D. Erosion thickness is only defined in 2D. They had no idea how to compute this object for 3D volumes. There's not even a, a nice way to generalize it the way they formulate it. Um, hey, Erin, excuse me, question. Mm -hmm. Can you go back to the previous slide? Mm -hmm. Uh, what exactly is the difference between uh, on the bottom row between the left hand side and the right hand side? They Absolutely. Look very, they're very similar to me. They are very similar. Um, what I'm trying to highlight is how the box has moved. If you look at the very significant portion of the skeleton under potential residue versus erosion thickness, potential residue has drastically shifted over, and whereas erosion thickness is almost in the same place. So what I'm looking for here is stability. If you perturb the shape, if it's messy, does the signature stay relatively stable? And between these two, for this, I'll grant you rather artificial noise, the, the adding jaggedy bits, so it's only noisy on one side, um, potential residue was less stable because the, the center sort of moved over a lot based on the jaggedy parts that were added versus erosion thickness, which looks almost the same. Okay. That makes sense? Yep. Everybody else good? At this point, this is like the survey of all of them. I promise I'll get to what we did for ours in a minute here. Okay. Uh, so now I'm not working at all. Bear with me here. Okay. So erosion thickness, unfortunately, was limited to 3D. There was, in fact, no real explicit definition. It was this heuristic pruning algorithm um, that seemed to work really well, but they didn't give any guarantees. Um, so it was, in a sense, much harder to prove something nice about it, say that it's stable. They did a bunch of experiments, and it seems to be stable, but that's still, you know, channeling a bit of math here. would like to prove something about it if we can. So what we came up with was a generalization connected to this, which we called the burn time function. Um, so we define the burn time on a medial axis, and this is a really natural generalization. So this is the medial axis of the same little 2D shape that I show a lot. But instead of just burning in from the boundary to get the quench sites, I'm going to start burning the medial axis. And I'm going to start burning it at the minute it's been exposed by this grass fire, right? So we start burning in here at local, and, and now the fire, all the boundary points on the medial axis are gonna start burning. Now my eventual goal is gonna be thresholding and significance. So you can see that middle one didn't keep burning because if I threshold, I don't wanna destroy the topology of the skeleton. So if I turn that dial of how much of the medial axis am I keeping, no matter what, this object will stay connected. It'll keep the topology. Okay, so this is meant to be indicative. In fact, here's the, uh, maybe, 
here's the 3D picture of the same thing. You can imagine burning all of it. As things get exposed, they start burning at unit speed along the medial axis and they keep burning. Um, so this is a 2011 paper. This was actually our first collaborative paper with Taoju. Um, this gave a really natural way in practice just for 2D right now to classify important features and to, to sort of identify how central a point is, which I'll try to hand wave a bit and refer you to the, the paper for details. Um, so we go through some formality here to, to define it. So we define this in terms of exposing trees, which are trees contained on the medial axis, which must, when you cross a bifurcation point, when you go over a degree three vertex where things are not a, a nice one manifold, a nice edge, you have to branch and make it to the boundary. And we weight this tree appropriately and define something we call burn tree. So this is one of these mins over the, like inf over the soup kind of definitions where I'm gonna say, look at all the trees you could have. For each tree, take its longest branch and take the minimum of those possible trees, right? So here I'm showing two possible trees for a point X. The longer branch of the shorter tree is highlighted in red on the right. The other tree, which is shown on the left is much longer. So it doesn't achieve the minimum of the maximum, right? One of these sort of natural min-max parameterizations. Okay, again, details, technical things. What we're able to prove in the end is that uh, it, this function exists for 2D shape and is finite everywhere except on a maximally closed subcomplex. So here uh, on the right showing one that's burning in, on the left is a simply connected one. The one of the downsides here, which is an upside in my world, is you'll notice when it burns into the loop on the right side, it dies. There's no boundary on that. It's hit a, an edge, a manifold region, and it's not allowed to break the topology. Hence, it doesn't break the topology. It keeps all the loops. So this was an important facet for us because we wanted to maintain topology. So this, this gray area we say just has infinite burn time. It never burns away. Okay, now you might also start to see hints, although we're not in 3D yet, of why the topological repair we started with was so important. I need something fairly nice in terms of not having extraneous topology if I'm gonna force you to maintain the topology throughout. So that was our goal here. Okay, so what were the properties in 2D? We get some nice ones. Um, it's continuous through the shape, except at these branch points. Um, it's upper semi-continuous everywhere, so it jumps in a fairly predictable way. It has no local minima for simply connected shapes. Um, so it's a really good way to find center points of 2D objects, which was one thing we didn't quite expect. So this is meant to indicate this. The, the middle row is um, common ways of finding a center point would be centroid, the centroid doesn't have to be in the shape if it's non-convex, which is kind of a nice feature if you can get it. The geodesic center can be on the boundary, and there's a notion called the geographic center, which is not unique. If, if you have sort of symmetry here, you can get more than one geographic center. So the extended, the EMA, we called it the extended medial axis. The, I would call it the, the burn, lower dimensional burn point now, um, is very central because it lives on the medial axis. It's only one of them and it's always in the interior, which is all good for us. And what we found experimentally, if you look at the bottom row, so these are different articulated images. This is a, you know, a clearly a person moving their arms and legs around, you know, imagine a dancer. Um, the points jump all around depending on which notion you use because this is a non-convex articulating image, but the R version, that EMA point, the red one stays very fixed in the center because it has to live on the most significant branch of medial axis, which no matter how you move the person around, as long as it stays simply connected, you know, it, it hurts if you have loops, but um, if you don't have loops, it stays really embedded in the core there experimentally. So this gave us hope for stability. This paper didn't prove stability, but we conjectured that it was stable under perturbations. Okay, this somewhat surprisingly, um, this burn time function we designed gave us a new way to look at erosion thickness, which remember was the function I really liked, that iterative pruning, how much do you lose? It turns out erosion thickness mathematically is burn time minus the local feature size, minus the radius at the point. Uh, this takes some, some doing to prove. So uh, 
refer to the paper for details, but it gave us a closed form solution based on this other function for this very nice, very stable measure that we were interested in. Um, and in a sense, what we found this did, this erosion thickness really measures tubularity of the 2D shape. Burn time really measures sort of length of the medial axis around you. And then radius is our usual thickness measure. Um, so the combination of these three gave us a, a lot of connected significance measures. Um, again, one of the goals of this work. How did this actually work? Well, here's distance to the boundary versus object angle versus potential residue versus burn time for a moving 2D shape. And again, this was just a proof of concept implementation. Um, this is from a paper by uh, Dave Letcher and one of my PhD students, Kyle Sykes, who worked on the project, where they proved a notion of stability and that this pruned medial axis was a fairly nice object. Okay, keep moving here. We'll see how much I get through here. I may jump some stuff. So let me, let me gloss over three dimensions a bit. Um, we do generalize this to three dimensions. It took us several years. This is going to be fast forward. <laughs> 3D is more complicated. So in 3D, your medial axis is a piecewise flat cellular complex, and there's weird local geometric features. So generically, any point on the medial axis has one of six possible classifications. You can be just on a nice sheet, or you can be on like a thin hitting, or you can be on boundary, or there's even a, you can be on a flat sheet with a fin above you and a fin below you. So it gets ugly compared to the nice degree three tree you get in 2D. And what this meant was we, we have the same intuition. I want to get to the 2D medial axis of the 3D shape and start burning it. But the local geometry and how we're going to burn across and maintain topology gets a lot messier. Um, so what we do, let me just gloss over these slides entirely. The key is to generalize this notion of exposing tree, right? From a point, all the trees that get to the boundary that you could burn around. And you have this infimum, you take the longest one and then you take the shortest over all possible trees. Okay, it's fairly technical because this is a non-manifold. There's branching structure. We've got to look at all the six possible classifications, but in general, you can do this. Um, so here's sort of a picture of what these exposing trees cartoon, but what it looks like is it crosses a singular set. It's got a branch both ways. I'm going to wave my hands vigorously and, and again, refer you to the paper. Um, this does work fairly well. We're able to take the 2D medial axis. Oh, and my movie froze. Let me try that again. Okay, well, that's disappointing. It's not moving back. Okay, we're just going to go to properties. Bear with me. I'll see if the next movie works. Um, we managed to formalize this definition somewhat excruciating five pages of proofs later. We get some nice properties of it's upper semi-continuous. It's one Lipschitz and continuous on manifold. It behaves well, which is what we were really after uh, in an almost continuous manner. Um, and <laughs> indeed, it's finite and exists away from topology. If you have a, a sphere or a, a closed curve, I'm going to maintain topology. But otherwise, it works well for pruning the, the simply connected bits. This was a SIGGRAPH paper in 2016 that we have most of this in. Um, now, in 2D, we had this nice characterization of tubularity versus length versus thickness. In 3D, the this we get a nice version of erosion thickness for the first time, which sort of measures how plate-like you are. Are you in the middle of like a flat plate looking region? Um, and then burn time is sort of measuring width in the media, the 3D shape along the medial axis. And then of course, local feature size is still thickness. So this gives us a nice set of uh, significance measures to work with for later analysis. Okay, so it's kind of hard to compute <laughs> geodesics on, on branch spaces turn out to be a whole thing. There's a nice version of computing geodesics on two manifolds, this Mitchell, Mountain, Papa, Demetrio result. My PhD student, Kyle, really attempted to generalize this approach to our setting, but couldn't guarantee termination of the algorithm. So if it terminates, it computes it exactly. But um, the geometry can be really complicated with these singular set things, which is what they didn't have on the two manifold. Um, so instead, we approximate it. Uh, one of the reasons this is a SIGGRAPH paper is they want to compute it anyway, even if it's hard. So they do a sort of approximate Dijkstra refinement. For each triangle, add Steiner points to the edges for some parameter epsilon, and then draw the complete graph inside 
And yes, you take a penalty instead of the straight red line on the right, you approximate with two slightly bent. But if you add enough Steiner points, this converges to the correct measurement astoundingly quickly in practice. Um, so it worked really well. And so this, this is a lovely executable. You can import 3D meshes and compute uh, both the skeleton and significance functions on it. Um, it's available on my collaborator, Yaji's GitHub. Um, now, we want a skeleton. And so I'll gloss through this fairly quickly because I know we're nearing the end. Um, what we do is we use this approximation. We say, OK, you've got these curves we're taking, which are approximate. Dualize it in a very particular way. Those are the green curves on the right. Uh, around the shortest paths you actually took, look for the dual skeleton. OK, you get something extraordinarily messy, just like the medial axis. The medial axis is extraordinarily messy. This is not a surprise. but if you weight it with a significance function, you can start to pick out ridges and really get the core of the skeleton that we're after in a very geom geometrically and topologically aware fashion. And the end result is in a 3D shape, we're getting again this tubularity length and width and we get beautiful skeletons. All the details are in the paper. I'll refer you there for more than the high level idea. But the goal is this picture on the right of the hand where I, in this big messy skeleton I'm computed, the, the significance measure can actually keep the fingers, depending on where you threshold it, and give you a nice reconstruction of the central skeleton. Okay, so let me conclude. This is, uh, oh, it is, by the way, that was all on meshes. It is generalizable to voxelized data also, which was a paper two years later. All of these things take a lot of details, so it, it took a little bit. This is by my collaborators, but. Um, now, we eventually fit this into a tool. So let me go back to the roots for a minute. I can simplify the shape. I can compute the skeleton with some statistics. Now, what we need to do, which is taking a surprising amount of time for those working in applied more, like it turns into almost an engineering problem. Now I need to make a tool which a plant biologist can use. You cannot hand them C++ code. They don't live in that world. So we need a nice executable, which will import the mesh quickly compute the simple, or not the mesh, the voxelized data, quickly compute all the skeletons and simplifications and, and significance functions on it, and let them interact with it in a meaningful way. So this is a snapshot of the current tool, which my, my colleague Tao's lab is leading. He's had a, a, a string of students working on turning this into a pipeline. Um, we need to identify, so this is actually a sorghum root as opposed to a, a corn root, but we need to identify these central things and simplify them. Sorghum, by the way, is a headache because they don't typically grow isolated. They like to grow in groups. And so sorghum tillers often have three or four roots <laughs> or stems coming out of them. Um, we need to then, we do some pretty simple like break any remaining cycles that we've missed because we only clean up about 99% of the topology and then try to maximize hierarchies and identify that, yes, this is in fact the main route. This is the first world. This is the second world. So that we can later do things like shape descriptors. How many branches are there? Um, which ones are at different levels? How long are they? What's the angle? They call waviness sort of a winding number analog tortuosity in plant science. They want to know how tortuous the root is, how much it waves around, um, thickness and everything. So the, the end result of this whole pipeline currently is we've got a pipeline, which in about eight minutes per root, and again, they dig up hundreds of these every summer, um, can give you a reasonable hierarchy with shape analytics on it. Now, their goal right now is to now use this tool to figure out what genetics control shape. That work is still ongoing. We just handed them this tool in the, the last few months, honestly. Um, so we're just getting started on the more serious genetic analysis. And here's a, a snapshot of how our tool, Topo Root, which is what Dan, my collaborator, named it, compares to sort of dynamic roots, which is one of the state-of-the-art tools they use prior to this. Um, it seems to be able to gather more accurate statistics and do a better job of identifying things. But this work is preliminary and is appearing in a biology journal, so it's, it's much less the geometry I'm talking about today. Okay, so that's the pipeline. Um, they're working also on adapting this to other plant architectures. So this is an article that just appeared on sorghum particles, um, which are the top. How many people know plant 
biology, I didn't, but they're trying to apply it to the top half of the plant also. These skeletons are pretty general purpose. Um, again, this is nice because it's a simply connected data set. There's no cycles in the top half of the plant. It's, it doesn't work that way. Um, and the final result is this nice pipeline, which is, is now available. The, the paper's under, actually it's under review now, um, but this is this pipeline that we're publishing with the biologists. Okay, whirlwind, and I think I'm right at time. Um, we're continuing to work on this. I, I can show like a slide of future directions. Um, it, we're trying to apply this to other data sets. I'm playing with grape leaves now, which are the top things. And there's also some real world data on the bottom where it's noisier. <laughs> like they don't dig up one root and scan it. They're scanning them in the fields as they grow to get a time varying data set on the top half of the root. Um, so these are really messy data sets. Like biology is messy. I like computers much better. So we're, we're trying to figure out what to do with this. There's also uh, other time varying data sets. So both of these are showing the left is cabbage and the right is lettuce. And they, here's my graphics collaborators who make things move. They can get the data set over time as it's growing and evolving. And we can look for, like, this is a, a good indication of plate likeness because you can see the lettuce leaves are growing in very set layers. Um, this is courtesy of my next door neighbor's lab, who's also working with the plant biologist. Okay, I'll stop there because that was a whirlwind at the end of all these future directions. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Irene. Uh, thank you very much, Irene. Uh, time for questions. Anybody? Question? Uh, I have a few questions, but let me start with one. Uh, I guess that if you have this dynamic growing process, then what you may want to compare is some four dimensional data. Yes. Any idea how to generalize your measures to we have, your process? We have ideas. So, so the, the medial axis is really just timestamps as they grow. Um, the problem is once you're in 4D and you're looking at time pairing, you now have different, you have like intensity, you have neighborhood and you have time. And so in topological data analysis, you're straight, you're squarely now in multi-dimensional persistence, which has no good closed form ways to compute it canonically. So we're looking at different heuristics to pick parameters and try to essentially reduce the dimension. We're also looking at solving it independently in each timestamp, but then using the neighboring ones to fix things. And like a more of the heuristic, okay, you get your medial axis in each, now look at how close you are to the, your neighbors and try to fix yourself to be more like them and do this in all the different layers and sort of hope things converge to something nice. Um, this is what our research meetings, I, I have one in a couple hours, are focused on is, is how to deal with this multi-D. Because um, yeah, it's a 4D data set and it gets much uglier. Okay. Stay tuned. Uh, Maybe I'll have a good answer in a year or two. <laughs> uh, other questions? Don't be shy. Uh, I, I do, I'm curious about the, the preliminary step of repair. There's been a lot of work on repairing meshes. Mm -hmm. it, is it, it's not difficult to adapt from other uh, techniques? That's effectively what we started with. So the, the, the things I showed in the beginning that had all those errors are the mesh repairs. Like that's the output of all the traditional reconstruction algorithms. Okay. So they, they tend to look at outputting a mesh that's as close to the input, but everybody acknowledges that in practice there's artifacts and imaging errors and, and what comes out is not great. And unfortunately, those errors that come out of it really impact the skeleton, right? The, some of it is that I'm doing the medial axis, which is designed to not do well in the presence of noise. Um, and, and I'm really using a significance measure that works best on simply connected medial axes. Um, so I have to do more repair even after the initial surface reconstruction is computed. That's a really good question. We thought those would work well out of the box and we're kind of surprised that they didn't. 
but it, it's maybe not too surprising given the artifacts included in the repair. Yeah, yeah. Huh. Uh, anybody questions? So I uh, I, I read a question from uh, Damro. Does it work well with mechanical shapes? Ah, that is an excellent question, and I have no idea. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so okay. I would be fascinated to see if it did. So the, the tool is publicly available, as is all the code along the way. Um, honestly, I don't have the right collaborator in that domain to try things out and, and get a good feedback cycle. The, the application we found and the collaborator who was really willing to engage with this was the plant shapes. Um, I would suspect the skeletons would work. I would also suspect, I'm starting to believe this is very data-driven. And so you'll probably have different artifacts and need a slightly different simplification process. But I'd be curious if out of the box, it already worked really well. I, I honestly